Good afternoon. It is a good afternoon. Lord have mercy. It is April the something, and it's just feeling like May the something already. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm already starting to get my little suntan. How about you? Okay, so when's the last time that we've chatted? Went to New York and had some wonderful things happen. Went to Orlando and had some better things happen. And I just posted today or yesterday because I've just gotten around to it. But did you guys know? Yes, you knew because I told you that not only is this year marking my milestone 60th birthday, but this is our 25th year. This is my 25th year in business. November 1999 is when I took on the challenge of Life by Dallas. I'm so excited. I can hardly believe that it's been 25 years. I have friends that had children after we started the business and those children have graduated from college and are having their own children. How crazy is that? But it's wonderful that God has kept me. They say that most businesses last an average of five to seven years, I think, something like that, before they fell. So it's been 25 years and we just... Oh, those first 15 were just grinded out like the some sense we're about to do the gospel. Sure enough, Hebrew slavery is what I went through. But boy, has God brought me to the promised land of milk and honey. Oh yeah, so it's great that things are getting easier. On the last leg or the downwind, things are getting better and better and better. So many more exciting Things are going on, exciting challenges. I sent a package to Serena Williams this morning. I've been up since three o'clock, it's last night. Somebody gave me the password and they were like, I talked to my girl, send the package here. I got the personal email address. So we're gonna see what happens, but all of a sudden when I started talking about selling True Pop popcorn and just things just started popping and I'm like, you know, maybe I just better back off for a minute. So we will see, we will see, we will see where the good Lord takes us because only where he takes us are we going. Can you believe that we are in chapter seven? We are out of chapter six. We're in chapter seven. That's just about halfway there. So this has been a journey in and of itself. Talk about being in business 25 years. It's been two and a half years that we've been on this Gospel of Mark trajectory. We have 16 chapters. In the Gospel of Mark, we are at chapter number seven. So we're almost halfway there, but these last chapters go much faster than the first four or a little longer. So here we are. Mark seven, one through three. Now this entire chapter has a lot to do with very ceremonial ritual rites. I said there in your, uh, your little heading How many of you are into the ritualistic, the religious rituals, ceremonial practices, the traditions that have been handed down from years to years, some of the things that we still do so interesting, having come off of Easter Resurrection Sunday, is that, you know, people are a trip. Because if you're walking, you know, it's one thing if you're inside of the church, because sometimes the church always wants to be on the same page, you know, um, but if you're outside of the church on Easter Resurrection <laughs> Sunday and you just see people, I think I went to the hospital to visit my dad on that Sunday. And so just anybody that you see, you know, as they're approaching, you're like, happy Easter Sunday, happy Resurrection Sunday. If you say Easter Sunday, when people feel a need to say happy Resurrection Sunday, as if to say, Ain't no Easter Sunday. I'm so much smarter than my elders. I'm so much better than the folks that grew us up on Easter. You know, is it that big of a deal? If we're all selling at the end of the day, are we celebrating the phraseology or are we celebrating the resurrected Christ? What's in our heart? And that's exactly, that's probably not the best example, but that's what this verse is all about. But I was thinking too, of my journey and learning how to play tennis. You know, I've been through some stuff. So as a child, when my father would take us to the courts, 
If my brother was a better hitter, the rest of us would just be like hanging around. But I would always go and hit on the wall and I found hitting on the wall was extremely good for your leg development. You know, cardio, just, you know, just see the ball, hit the ball. See the ball, try to hit the ball fast. See the ball, try to hit the ball faster. You know, it had nothing to do with bounce, weight, hit it in this range or hit it in that range. And then when you started wanting to play competitive tennis, depending on who you were playing with, working with, there came a lot of rules. You know, you gotta hold the racket this way, you gotta swing this way. And you're wondering, well, what is going on here? Because I can hit a ball. I can hit a ball like 50 times before I not hit the ball, even after one bounce. And so it became mechanical, it became this and that. But those were lots of rules and regulations, but it, it led to something that ultimately it would make you a better player because then you would have consistency. The consistency meant that you didn't have to wonder whether or not it was gonna go in, you didn't have to hope and pray that it was gonna go in. If you were following the proper mechanics and it was gonna go in, chances are a very high percentage of that. So that's rules and regulations that are going to be highly beneficial if they're followed. The Pharisees and the scribes, which we're about to talk about, came up with their not even rules and re they were rules and regulations pertaining to cleansing and cleansing and cleansing, but it didn't amount to anything at the end of the day at the end of the day and that's what we're going to talk about and so while you're listening to this and you're thinking about some of the things that you're doing on resurrection sunday you know wear white to church that's all good that we recognize the color white and its relationship to resurrection but to have a church full of folks that's already highly pretentious about what they're going to put on on sunday mornings to the point where this is not feeling a certain way or looking a certain way they ain't coming to church and then you throw on and wear white. Not this, And then they, they cautiously tell you that, hey, if you don't have white, come anyway. Well, what's the point in even mentioning it? When we have people that come to church and don't speak to the people sitting next to them on the pew, people that come to church and are just so mean and honorary to their neighbors, their relatives, anybody on the way to church, anybody coming from church, should that be more of our focus than what we wear and you know, where we sit in the church, you know, these people sit here, these people sit here. I mean, it's just a lot of stuff. And these kind of things just kind of agitate you a bit because you're, especially if you're thinking on that plane of where's the love? Can it just, just show me some love? Forget everything else. I'd rather have the love. What about you? So just keep that in your mind as you're practicing whatever it is that you practice, not just on Sundays coming and going from church or being in church, but every day during the week, what kind of message are we sending that we act religiously, you know, that we shout and scream really, really well, that we know how to get out of praise. And so there's some videos that are going around where there's a lady and anybody that comes into the church, she comes in and she just starts dancing. <laughs> and some of the people look at her like, you better go somewhere. And then it's just interesting because some people get right down into it. It's really funny. It's one of my favorite things to do when I feel like laughing is go find those videos. Okay, I'm moving on. Mark 7, 1 through 3, I think we're doing today. Defilement. The title of this particular section, I'm reading from the my favorite, New King James Version. It says, defilement comes from within. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a specific way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Okay, we're going to start with 
verse 5 next week. So we're going to stop right there because that's pretty much the two things I want to talk about today. Next week elaborates or expounds upon it. Not next week, but the week after next. But we're going to stop right here. That's enough. That's enough. And so when it says, let's just see what they're saying here. They're saying that when the Pharisees <clears throat> and some of the scribes had come. So the scribes are this group of people, I think it was third, fourth century before Christ that came along and they took for the Orthodox Jew, let's go back here. So for the Orthodox Jew, there were two things that were considered religious law. And that was obviously the Ten Commandments. And then secondly, the Pentecost, which are the first five books of the Bible. Primarily in that, focusing on Deuteronomy and Leviticus, where you get a slew of laws. And they took that slew of laws, and it's like they took each law and made it a hundred more laws in one. And that's really, and they talk about even this thing of washing hands, their 12 treaties on them in terms of how you do it. So let's talk about that. So that's what they're complaining about. They came from Jerusalem. Obviously, if they're coming from Jerusalem, some other Pharisees have says, hey, you've got to come see this. And why are they saying this? Why is Jesus and what his disciples and what he's doing such an irritant to so many people? And that's because folks are following him. Folks are praising him. Folks are just, he's got his, he's been put out of the synagogues. And he's preaching on the shorelines. He's preaching. He's developed his church on the shorelines. And, you know, right there, he's got all these Palestinian, Palestinian uh, farmers listening to him. They're coming in groves. And now people are coming from all over the place to hear him. And so now he becomes the spotlight. Do you know, whenever you're doing something well, folks are going to look and try to find something wrong with what you're doing. So they didn't have to look very far because Jesus was not one that was going around teaching folks rules and ceremonial practices and rituals. Jesus was going around teaching people how to be good on the inside, how to love God and love their fellow man. That was his concern. That was his teaching. So these people come along and say, hey, 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 you have all of these disciples, these followers, these want to be like you. Why don't they wash their hands? And what was interesting is they said, why is it that his disciples don't wash his hands? That begs one to wonder whether or not Jesus practiced the washing of hands. I don't know. I'm just thinking that, but it didn't say why y'all. It just says why it doesn't his disciples wash his hands. So that's what they were complaining about. So again, their religious law were following the commandments and the five first books. And so what was this thing? And in this particular passage, they're focusing on the washing of hands and the washing of vessels, the copper, the pitchers and cups that they're talking about in the last uh, uh, verse here. So let's talk about washing the hands. So when they talk about washing the hands, then how is it that they know they're not washing their hands? Now they should have had some of these practices <laughs> in place for us. Because we would never become obese if we had to go through this. Because not only did you have to wash your hands to begin your meal, you had to wash your hands after each course. And of course, we don't do that anymore. People put your, if they, whatever they put on the table, people eat all of it at the same time. There is a thing called, you know, eating something first and then the main course and then the dessert or whatever. And so in between each course, and we have a lot of five course meals. You're supposed to wash your hands. So washing the hands was because not only were your hands considered to be unclean when you went out, especially if you went out into the market where there were Gentiles, but things were unclean. So everything, I mean, it was just, you know, a woman after childbirth was unclean. Certain animals were unclean. So it's just a lot going on. But the practice of washing the hands involved if I'm going to wash my dirty hands, so the, listen, the ritual goes something like this. So hands up or hands down. So the, the ritual goes that you have to have your hands upward, and then you have to have clean water. So the clean water has to be in a certain type of vessel, because certain vessels were considered to be clean and unclean, whether or not they had leather on them, whether or not they were flat, or they had a rim, or they were made out of copper with... 
um, metal inside or metal with copper or wood, you know, so depending on all of that stuff, but the particular vessel that held the clean water to be used for hand washing had to be a stone vessel. It had to meet all the criteria that it could not be considered unclean or it couldn't get unclean. And then only clean water could be put in there and it had to be in a manner such that nothing could fly into it, nothing could fall into it. So first you've always got to have that. Imagine this, that you've always, if you're washing your hand this many times in between meals and you're doing it for guests and you're doing it for people that are coming in, you have to have separate water to wash because you know you always had to get the sand off of the sandals, that pe off the feet from the sandals that people wore. So they used to have to have a lot of water on hand. But this ceremonial water is what they call the clean water that is used for cleaning the hands. So it had to be a minimum of what they called a log, which was the equivalent of one and a half eggshells. <laughs> Couldn't find anything else to, to suit that when you looked it up. One and a half eggshells filled. You need a minimum of that amount of water that you would hold your hands upward and then the water would be poured onto your hands such that it fell at least down to your wrists. So now my hands are wet. Then you take the fist of one hand to clean the other hand while it was wet. And then the fist of the opposite hand to clean the opposite hand while it was wet. So in the process of that happening, if my hands were unclean and I put clean water on my hands and I did that little jiggy riggy, now my hands are considered to be unclean again, even though they've been cleansed from whatever original crap. So now all you have to do is just rinse them again. It's kind of like when you go wash your hands or brush your teeth, then you have to rinse. Okay, so now all of this is done with the fist and it had to be done in that order. Now you flip your hands upside down so that the hands and the fingertips are downward and then you pour more water on it such that the water falls from the wrist to the fingers. That's a lot just thinking about it. And imagine, see God knew me in my heart when we were going through the pandemic and people were all of a sudden thinking that they had to wash their hands. So I wash my hands, hands. But if I had chopped the apple and the apple falls on the floor, I don't care if it's been down there two seconds, four seconds, or 10 seconds. I'm going to pick it up and I probably will eat it and I probably will not rinse it off. That's why I eat all this good stuff to my immune system. That's why God made me. I'm telling you, you better leave stuff alone and be as you are because God created you as you are because he knew the beginning, the middle, and the end. And God knew me. <laughs> I'm just, I remember during the pandemic, I used to be like, whoa, child, that's too much. People were just like overboard. And these were the same people that were eating stuff that will kill you. And I was saying to myself, seriously, I'm laughing because I'm remembering. But it was just too funny because I was trying, I was going to be doing things. And I was trying to do things differently because everybody around me was so paranoid. But that just ain't my speed. I'm the type of person that keeps my hands in the dirt, in the garden. So it's just not that serious to me. I believe a little bacteria is good for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. So where am I? Where am I? Okay. So they had to do all of that. But if you had to do all of that, we would be eaten. Can you imagine this? <laughs> Can you imagine the nine out of ten Americans that snack two and a half times a day? <laughs> if, they, if they had to go through all of that, they'd be like, nah, I don't think so. And then we could cut down some of this overweight problem that we have. Lord have mercy, Jesus. It's getting too late in the afternoon for me. So those are the things that they had to do. But what does that mean? And so the sad thing about all of this is that it had nothing to do with hygiene. It had nothing to do with hygiene. It had nothing to do with whether or not you were clean or the food was clean. It had to do with if you did not do this, you were considered to be unclean to worship God. You were considered to be sinning against God. Now go figure that foolishness. You know, and so that's what it was. And so that's the case that they made against Christ. And so when I think about this just a little more, when I think about this just a little more, so Jesus' disciples 
are not washing their hands. I don't know if that means that the, uh, the leader was in, involved too. But the disciples are not washing his hands. But these are the ones that have given up everything that they've been accustomed to, every creature comfort, to follow him. His disciples, these weren't the people that came to hear him. You know, they said the people that came to hear him brought the, the sick and the lame so that he could heal them. You had that group of the crowds that were coming, but then you had the group of the crowds. You had his appointed 12 disciples, the apostles, but you also have the ones that were coming and following him, taking up these practices. Those were considered his disciples as well. And so these are the people that they say weren't fit to be worshiping God. And they've given everything. They've walked away from what we would consider today worldly things to follow this man that's here to, 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 to make the lame walk and to make the blind see. And so it's twisted. It's twisted. And when you are thinking clearly, when you're eating food to allow your brain to function, I ask people sometimes when they're doing certain things, I'm like, okay, I, I, let's stop a minute here and think about what you're saying. Because there are a lot of things, activities and rituals and practices now that we're involved with that make absolutely, you know, I heard some stuff. I think when pastors get older, they just, you know, when they, we start out like them, not pastors, but preachers, you kind of start out with, I remember Pastor Street told me, I ain't letting you mess around with my people because I used to just be like, can't eat this, can't eat that. And then you kind of mellow out and you just kind of like help people wherever they are, take them where they are, you know, let them, you know, fall, 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 fall. Never say, how many times you're going to fall? Just kind of, and then I think when people start getting to that point where they kind of see the light and uh, the end of life, you know, whether that looks like everybody you grew up with is now dying, you know. So Alistair Begg is one of my favorite pastors. Him and Charles Stanley, and Charles Stanley just passed away, you know, um, my boy, my boy, Billy Graham went on first. And yeah, Charles Stanley. I was even listening to, um, what's the other guy? He's kind of hard. Uh, MacArthur the other day. And his voice sounds, you know, they just, they're getting older. You know, they're still on, all on radio, but they, they're getting older. And, uh, but Alistair Begg here lately, man, he's been like <laughs> hammering it down. I mean, he can, he's starting to offend some people, um, and they started to talk about it. But I think it has something to do when you're just, I think you're, you're hoping and wishing that you had more time, or you're just you're kind of looking around, and we're in a bad place. We're in a bad place, and you're just wondering, is it going to get any better? What You know, my time is limited. Should I just, you know, I think he's trying to just shake as many people as he can. He feels like he's running out of time. I don't know, but the last few times I heard him, I, you know, and I had no problem with it. But he was like, because he was talking about uh, just the other day, that the Super Bowl is one of the Super Bowl day and the amount of concentrated money that is spent on ticket sales, on entertainment, on all of the commercialism, around, just everything and how we could feed 15 countries and just the, the world paganism that is involved in that day. I was just like, wow. I mean, you have to, I'm not, and I don't want to do that because he's such a great person, but you have to pull that tape. You can pull any of his tapes off of Truth For Life. And that's a good one because, and that's good preaching when you, I'm sitting on the couch like you watching the Super Bowl. But when people start talking, when they can preach like that, and it really makes you start to contemplate, at least contemplate, whether or not you're going to watch the Super Bowl next year. I mean, that's some, that's what you call good preaching because good preaching convicts the heart when you know the truth is being said. You say whatever you want to say to try to justify stuff, but at the end of the day, if the Spirit of God is inside of you, you know truth and recognize it when you hear it. And that's what that's that's some good stuff. So it's, it, it was interesting, the points that, that uh, he made. Okay, so... That's the whole thing. It's just we took some time to go through the whole thing just because you want to see 
that this, we're getting to that point where the line of demarcation is drawn between Jesus, the Pharisees, and the scribes. And this is the beginning of that. And so I think what Mark wanted to do as we begin to go through, go through this, because later on the Pharisees are going to be trying to ask for a sign from Jesus, is that he wants to point out and to help you and me understand what Jesus was up against, you know? Sometimes you, you just kind of want to know what kind of folks you're dealing with. And this is what he was up against. These are the kinds of people that were considered to be the religious experts, the so-called leaders of that day, but supposedly for the same cause. Because they believe in God, they supposedly worship God, they supposedly love God with all their heart, mind, and soul. And this is what Jesus is coming to do and this is what he's dealing with. The people that are supposed to have the same agenda as he has are so far off the path from where he is because they have twisted the truth. They have twisted this thing to suit their own needs, their own agenda. And this is what's happening today in the church when we are all supposed to be doing the same thing. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, is what I said that Christ was doing in the beginning, that's why he probably wasn't concerned about whether these dudes were washing their hands or not, because he was more concerned about them understanding that we must love God and love our fellow man. And what does that look like? That looks like what happened on the road where the Samaritan was the one that came up and helped this brother that was beat up by some robbers. Do you know, it's what is happening on your heart. How do people know who we are? They're supposed to know who we are by our love. And I can tell you, I can tell you, because there's some folks that you may not get along, some people that push the wrong buttons. But at the end of the day, will people be able to say, well, at least he was a kind person. At least they were a nice person. How people are not going to be able to hate you as much or be as confrontational with you because the kindness inside of you is able to trump the evil inside of them. And that really works, it really does. And I can't explain it. The thing to do to be able to experience that is to try it. Just try to be as kind as you can. You know, in our 25 years, I tell people my ethos, my, my, my MO on a regular basis is that, especially after I was at the Washington home, I was at the Washington home for 13 years in the Sick and Shut Ministry. And very, very affluent, uh, very wealthy home, especially the first 10 years that I was there. Then they started uh, accepting some other uh, medications or insurance plans. But you would see people that were just sitting in a chair, whether they want a trach or whatever, and they would be just like this, staring at something. And though they would be washed and cleansed and put to bed, and washed and cleansed and brought back out the next day. They'd be in that same chair, in that same position, with that same stare. And I'd just be like, wow, you know? And so I'd always thought about that. And I would always say, you know, when people are, you know, being lazy, so to speak, trifling, and I'd just be like, you know what? Why are you taking up space? You know, if you're not gonna do anything worthwhile, if you're just gonna get up every morning and roll out of bed, complain about everything, and just, you know, you could be just like some people that are totally incapacitated to the point where they are completely dependent on care 24-7. Do you know? Not to say that they don't belong here or anything, but I'm just saying, if you are able to move and do for yourself, then why not be beneficial instead of just taking up space? So I've always just said, you know, I am happy when I go to bed every night to know that someone has benefited from me being alive today. And that's an active thing. That is to put some effort towards that. That is to go out with a mindset, an intentionality that I am going to be kind to someone. You don't necessarily have to give somebody a hundred bucks or wash their car or anything, but just be kind, just acknowledge their existence. Some people, you know, sometimes when I'm walking on a trail and stuff, people just, they don't know how to, to communicate. They just, they, I don't know what it is that they, they, they feel like they're going to mix, it looks like they're going to have a heart attack or something. Just 
and trying to avoid you. It's almost like if you speak to them, they're just, they're just gonna have a heart attack or die, you know. And I used to speak to everybody because I don't know if I'm gonna fall out and die on my run or whatever. And you might have to get me CPR. And you just walk by me and didn't speak. So, yeah. And um, <laughs> just a shameless plug here. And so, in honor of that, for 25 years, 365 days a year, that comes to 9,125 or 75. And that is the amount of individuals that we are going to purposely make a difference in their life by offering them the Wellness on Purpose Kit, the WOP Kit, a W-O-P. And that is going to be a package with both of, our, both of my books, Fitness ABCs by Dallas, Temple Restoration, the ebook, which is my best piece of work. We're going to get the little UPS port for you. And then um, the bag of tea, which is an organic herbal blend that I created. That's a 12 week supply. And then a box of all five bags of the popcorn. All to you for just $99. And we are hoping that we crush the 9,125 by our anniversary date, which is November 1920. November 2025, November 2024. So in five months, we're hoping to actually meet one million cells, not just 9,175. Okay, so defilement comes from within. It's whether or not your heart is defiled because you're just a mean, ornery person. So start being kind, start thinking love, 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 love. That is what God did. And we want to love, love, love because that is what he did for us. And that's what makes us clean on the inside. So what makes us clean by our own efforts is juices. So this time of the year, as it starts, you know, we pick up a little weight in the wintertime. It's, I don't have a lot of sunlight, you know, but in the summertime when it's warm like this, I'm just like piercing out on this grass like, okay, or, or I know it's screaming. Are you going to cut me today? I did some work in the garden like four weeks ago. I was on a roll. I haven't been out there to check on it yet. So, but when it's warm, but I have been on the tennis court. So it's warm like this. We want to take advantage of that, but we also want to feed our bodies a little bit more cleansing. Just like that green stuff that's coming from the trees, just stuff gets in our system when we don't routinely clean it. So this is something that's going to be easy for us today. I have two sets of things here. Something's very simple which is very, very, very good for you. And then I have my pineapple here, but after I started to look at it and squeeze it, I'm thinking we might not be able to do the pineapple, which makes it easy because then you can follow along the next time because you're gonna need a pineapple, you're gonna need some grapes with seeds, and you're going to need some oranges, okay? Three little ingredients, and we're gonna make a fabulous cleansing drink. I know that this is not ready because I'm pulling on the leaves. If you pull on the leaves of, uh-oh, there's one, but none of the rest of them came. Let's see, if we find three more, up, uh, <laughs> up, uh, okay. We can do the apple juice today. I thought I was gonna get us out of here early. But you can actually, so you really want them all to be just like falling out. See, that one's a little hard, that one's a little hard. That could be a result of the, somebody maybe dropping the pineapple. You can look at it and tell because it looks pretty decent when and you can't really smell it smell it <laughs> I have been I have been so mentally and physically exhausted I've been to Austin Houston New York City and Orlando in the last three weeks and I am just like, yeah, 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 yeah. people are all up in my face asking me questions 24-7. I don't get a chance to eat. I don't get a chance to take a break before the next thing is going on. I am just tired. Even people on the airplane and the train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I start acting silly because I need like three days of rest. But I can't smell anything. You wouldn't be able to smell it either because it's really not right. But that's when you know you can come into your home and you'll smell pineapple when it's ready to be done. And this looks too green. When the pineapple is ready to be cut, 
it won't necessarily be yellow. See, that yellow there is from this being bruised. Somebody in the store probably dropped it once or twice, and that's probably why these things came out, because those tips should be brown. And so we want to wait until this turns color. It's going to look like it's rotten almost. You want to catch it. It's a little tricky little thing because you want to get it just before it gets to be too bad like that. Because this has a thick skin. And so when you cut through it, even if it's a little brown on the outside, it's still going to be perfectly fine on the inside. So this is really, I wouldn't, you know, you can smell a pineapple. That's not, <laughs> this was just a teaser and a reminder for you that next time you can blend with me. So you're going to have a pineapple. We're just going to do like one blender full, which is going to be like two quarts. So that's a relatively small pineapple. We're going to take three or four oranges and probably about two pounds of grapes. One of the easy ways to do things is that when you're mixing things together, keep equivalent bowl sizes. Yeah. So that's that. So we're going to just do apple, <laughs> apple ginger lemon. So the lemon, as you know, antiseptic, high, high qualities for cleansing, cleansing, cleansing. Lemon juice is also what color? Lemon juice is yellow. So that means this is going to help with it being like a natural laxative. Then we have our apples. I've already washed them. Apples have lots of pectin, P-C-T-I-N in them, which is a first ingredient that you will see on most colon cleansers because it is so, so good for cleansing the colon. Oh, if anything else you, if anything, I was eating so many apples whenever I would come back home because I would just be like home sweet home and nothing makes you feel better. Anything that's going on, whether it's fatigue, mental, physical fatigue, eat an apple. So I have bought bags and bags of apples because that is what you do. So we have apples, which have a high level of pectin. We won't talk about the great things in oranges, grapes, and pineapples until next week. We have the lemon, which is yellow for... Natural laxative, but also yellow is associated with the liver. So when we look at the various organs, each one has a color to it. As you know, the kidneys are considered to be burgundy. That's why beet juice is so good for the kidneys. But when you think of yellow, you think of yellow dock. That's an excellent herb for liver disease, hypertension, all that stuff. So did I say hypertension? Not hypertension. <laughs> what is the liver disease? See, I'm tired. Okay, and then we have ginger, fresh ginger. Now, you can smell that because that has some bite to it. Oh, <laughs> this is right. You still can't smell. But take my nose for it. This is good. So ginger has all types of medicinal properties. Goes back to way, way when anything concerning the gastrointestinal system, that's what you have. This is uh, organic ginger. That's why it was in the refrigerator. I'm telling you, the problem with organic, though, you can't sit it in the windowsill, but so long it's going to start to look all crazy. So you just want to kind of slice off the edges a bit. If you scrub it really good, I didn't scrub it really good. I just rinsed it off. You can just throw everything in there. You always want to keep a considerable amount of whatever shell and peel that you're using for anything. So I'm just going to dice these up right quick. I love ginger. I love a lot of ginger. We're not going to use all of this because some of this was going to be added to a separate batch of pineapple ginger honey and then we had we're gonna have pineapple orange and grapes so next week two weeks when you get your pineapple oranges and grapes take a little bit of ginger and have some raw honey on hand and then you can do both of the drinks with us if not don't worry you'll just do one but it'd be pretty cool for you to chop up stuff along with me because some people don't know how to core a pineapple. It's pretty simple. This is a good sharp knife, but I usually use the big giant. You usually need a, a knife about that size when you're dealing with pineapples, watermelons, jackfruit, but anything else, these little babies. So we have the apple, you just wanna slice it. Usually kinda of core it. I usually do a better job of that where you only, only have to end up having the seeds be on one side or else you're gonna have to come back. Seeds are said to be a little poisonous. I would be dead by now if that were the case, but nevertheless, you can cut the apple like this. So you see the top of the apple. So if you come over just shy of the middle, that half doesn't have any seeds in it. 
Then you do the same thing on that side. That side doesn't have any seeds on it. So now you have most of your seeds here on the last piece, and then you cut on the opposite side. Bam! And then you don't have to do what I just did a second ago. So we are going to, this is a pretty good blender. I don't know, the last time this is my brand new blender. Went back to Blendtec. Yeah, that's probably why we weren't doing anything exciting the last few times, because I didn't have a blender. And so now when it gets warm like this and I'm really outdoors doing a lot of fun, sweaty activities, FSAs, <laughs> I usually make sure that I drink at least a quart of fresh juice. If you can, alternate days. I usually do apple, ginger, honey, or apple, celery, carrot, or carrot, apple, ginger on the vegetable days. Maybe throw some cucumbers in there, and then I will do, love my fruit days, pineapple, ginger, honey, apple, ginger, or apple, ginger, lemon, or both, are just, whew, in the book, Fitness ABCs by Dr. Dallas, which you will get one of in your WAP kit. <laughs> I'm going to figure out a million plugs. Um, under A for apple, it says... Apples, they're like many mineral vitamin pills because of the amount of nutrients that they have in them. They are very effective in cleaning, cleaning crap out of your system on a regular basis. Eat an apple every day. So the fitness tip says, take a bowl and put seven apples in it and place it on your desk or on your table at home. And each day, consume one of those apples. And at the end of the week, whatever you have left, throw it into a blender with some distilled water, then add some fresh lemon juice, and it makes an excellent mineral drink. That's one page of Fitness ABCs under A for apples. That's how the book is spelled out. There's a letter for each part in the nutrition section. Another letter for each part in the fitness, like H is for hills. Find yourself a hill and walk up and down the hill, up and down the hill. That is so much better than walking two miles or three miles or five miles if you just have five minutes to walk up and down the hills because that is going to tone and condition your legs. It's going to give you excellent cardio and it is going to help you lose weight while gaining muscle very quickly. And if you find a heel fitness tip, find the heel and kill the heel. Take two minutes and just kill the heel. So that's under H. Under meditation, K is for kindness. Never underestimate the simplest act of kindness. Make it your intention, fitness tip, to go out and be kind to someone today. Isn't that a great book? I just love my book. And so here we have it. We have distilled water. You're going to play with how much water you want to use. I never even looked to see. This is a total of four cups here. And so we're going to start now. The difference between this and what we'll learn next week is something like grapes, because you can also just do grapes and add apple cider vinegar to it. That's your wine drink. The longer you let that sit in the refrigerator, it continues to ferment. The better it is for your gastrointestinal system and the more it tastes like real wine. But the grapes obviously are going to give you a lot more water, like watermelon, than apples. Look at this. This hard apple, even though love me some Fuji apples, has plenty of flavor. But it's not going to give you a lot of juice by itself. And the thing about juicing is that, see all these apples that you're putting in here? And you could probably just drink all of this at one time. So think about that. Four apples. That's a lot of nutrients. So when you're blending or juicing, you're talking about a concentrated value, nutrient dense. So technically, you're supposed to dilute fresh juices. But notice, we're not juicing. We're blending. The difference between blending and juicing is that with blending, you're taking everything. Everything that I chop, I'm going to consume it. Versus juicing, you're extracting the juice from the pulp. So you have a whole lot of stuff left after you juice. When you blend, you're not doing that. So this one's going to be much more fiber dense than when you're juicing. The two are used for different reasons. If you're 
dealing with somebody that's extremely obese, it's been going through a lot, you might want to start with the juicing. But this, energy, a whole bunch of other stuff. So we're getting everything in here. You want to go and put your couple of pieces of uh, ginger in, understanding that just a small piece of the ginger like this is more than enough for about a quart of something. I like it a little bit more kick. So it doesn't matter because I'm usually when I take my bottles out, I'll have three or four bottles and then I'll just pour half and one, half and one. So then by the time I've completed all of the contents that I've cut up, then it's going to be evenly distributed through the three. So it's really not going to matter. Okay. And then you can put your lemon juice in before or after you blend it. Ah, oh, how simple is this? It's ridiculous that people don't do this. This is so inexpensive. How about bang for buck? the blenders that well the blenders that I and this is a good blender this is an expensive blender that I have to hold down on it I don't know if it's like you know my floor might be uneven or something but you know <laughs> And so that's exactly what we're going to do is we're going to separate this. If you have glass containers, it's always better to store in glass containers. Now, if you're not accustomed to juicing, you might want to thin it out a little more. And you thin it out by, because you can smell the ginger. You thin it out by adding more water. Or you can leave it a bit more concentrated. I just doing that. So that was four apples. This might be, that's not, so I knew, what did I say before? How many cups did I say? We had four, four cups, one cup is six, is nine ounces or so, eight, nine ounces, 32, 64. Yep, yeah, because that's about half a gallon so far. So look at that. With just four apples, I probably could use could probably put four apples. Mm. So it's going to give me about three quarts. I probably would have used, I did not, I don't know if that's going to be watery. I have some apples in the window downstairs. But I'm going, you know, apples and pears are like oranges and lemons or garlic and onions in terms of how they fit with one another. They're very both high fiber, very much into a good amount of pectin. Same in terms of their acid levels. So that's something you can add. So I'm gonna add those apples. <laughs> smell the pear really well. See the coloration of this one's a little darker, whitish yellow. So I'm gonna put half in here, half in there. And then once you drink it, if it seems a bit thick for you, you can always add some more water to it. And just so that took six, six minutes maybe, because I was talking. Six minutes, 
and you get three quarts of juice. And like I said, if you can go, do you see that on the top? So you get six quarts of juice. If you can go, um, I don't know where the top went. If you can do a quart of juice a day, you're really going to do your body well. If you want to fast for a day, some of you are into intermittent fasting now. This is something that would be great for you to try to knock out two, if not three, bottles in a day, if not four. You know, just with a couple more apples, a little bit more water, you could get easily uh, a gallon of juice. So this will clean you out on the inside. That takes care of the physical part. The mental part is just to keep your mind clean. When you know there are people that are coming around you, they love to use profanity, they love to gossip, they love to be negative, then you're just going to have to steer away from them. But then on the spiritual side, for those who are believers, the Holy Spirit is inside of you and wanting you to make the right decisions. So that right decision is having a spirit of love. Love for God, love for our fellow man. And that is what Jesus is saying really matters. That is what cleanliness is all about. See you in two weeks. Two weeks. Don't forget. So we can... What do they call the... the not DIYs, but when you are doing the show with somebody, do work. Come along, join love, join along, be alone. Cook along with us. Cook along show. So you're gonna need a medium sized, small and medium sized pineapple, about a pound or two of grapes, three or four oranges, not tangerines. You've got juice, um, juice oranges. That would be really good. This is not really a juice orange. You can tell because it's dark orange. But it'll do okay. The uh, kind of like uh, pale orange. You'll see it. It says juice oranges. Get you a bag of juice oranges. Get you some fresh organic ginger. And if you have just a cup or so of raw honey. Um, or you could use maple syrup. Or you could use agave. You could even use blackstrap molasses if you really wanted to go on the real clean side. But... That's what we're going to do next time. I hope this has been fun. This has been too, <laughs> too much fun for me. Um, happy anniversary, Life by Dallas, celebrating 25 years. Go check out our website. We have the information about the WAP kit. I would love to say you might be the first person, but we've already had someone be our first buyer in just one day of advertising. So we're excited. Um, I'm excited. I have lots of good news to share with you, but we're out of time. So next time, make sure you join us next time. Be good, be nice, love on somebody.